I could do the face of life thing, but it will require me to sit there for a while and wait for everything to sync up and allow me to do it. I know people who do it, but they have more professional setups. The library is going to be Well, we only have, let me see how many readers. Go over, I'm not going to know. Okay, but if it goes three to five, no more than five. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. 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 Hey everyone. Okay, this is live. Let me move back a little bit. Um, I'm Micah Zevin. Welcome to Fabula Cafe. Uh, hashtag City Artist Corps Grant. Thank you to Liz and Fabula Cafe and all the employees for uh, the delicious food and drink. Um, tip your servers. Um, this is the second one of uh, the uh, City Artist Corps Grant meetings that I'm doing here. And um, like all my Risk of Discovery reading series uh, that I have done in person or for the better part of a year and a half almost online on Zoom. I do poet I make up poetry prompts for myself and uh, I share it with everyone. I, and I do all of them and maybe I'll write, I usually, and I read a few of them. So I'm gonna read a few tonight. Um, the first one is write a 14 line American broken sonnet using the words foundation, robots, sympathizers, bells, and trees. The poem is titled Empire, it's burning spires, or the bees, they're dying, save them, please. Empire, it's burning spires, or the bees, they're dying, save them, please. Our foundations are trapped in shipping containers with toilet paper, computers, sleeping drones not yet stalking us like bees, as we are ravenous to spend less time worrying about worrying living ghosts will become our hosts and drown us in exhaustion about what is lacking. What will stop our heartbeats and make us not just incomplete? endlessly ringing bells, ready to quit senseless hard work, hated, causing dizzy spells of anxiety, realizing it's not even enough to go to the country to breathe in oxygen from apple trees, and others for respite, without empty shells, inflation's bite, pummeling. In this universe, we are burning sympathizers, who have been fooled again and again, believing there are two sides to an issue, when it's merely one side, a lying side and a factual side, a fascist hide grabbing power set to skin us as the robots take over, but poorly and inefficiently without saving our grace or our faces. Is that that one? Thank you. I'm going to do number two on the list. If you want one, I can give you a prompt later. If you want to do one, that's the risk of discovery portion of the reading. Anyone who's brave enough to do one on the spot and read it. Um, write a 10 line, five word per line poem called Plant Apple Seeds in an Attempt to Return the Earth to Its Roots. It's magic. 
repeated downpours create sodden feet. Our reservoirs fill to rims. Are we eroding simulations, wildfires? Poisonous rage sprays soil's foil, chemtrails falling, the males fails. Pile on overstocks of manure, replenish, feed, not clone herds, no seedlings growing into slicks, thick with green, birds stick. Don't hug trees, capture dew. There's that one. Want to learn more? Um, this one doesn't have a title, it's just called number three. It's uh, right at 12 line, home, line four. Upon awakening in ooze, you realize you are out of time, if not body. Line nine, do psychos shape history or the forever coming apocalypse, relegating us to the shadows? Number three, phantom ghosts like to roast, boast, and toast lies and spies. Will you become a weed on society, or a planner, or soothsayer? There's a sinkhole down the street from you, and you, and you, on the avenue. Upon awakening in ooze, you realize you're out of time, if not body, watching yourself drown in groaning sounds and vibrations, street noises accentuated by getting high. Waking up high, exercising high, and still not able to climb high rises and fly away at virgin ink boil of lava scrub. Thank you. So there's those three. Yeah, there's those are hot off the presses, so they say they're not done exactly. Um, so I'm going to read also from my book, which also was published during the the pandemic is called Metal Heavy, published by Elena Jennings, Poets Queen Press. I have copies if you're interested. Um, so we'll read a few from these and then I'll introduce our open micers. So it'll just be random this time. Um, Them Bones, an indirect Alice in Chains tribute. At 1.30 a.m. it sounded like my neighbors were grinding bones in the sink. It was like a very old, about to break vacuum, ready to cough up its final lung. I was trying but failing to be in love, not like the giant in Jack and the Beanstalk was, about to grind me down to make his bread. Also, I had just watched one of the final episodes of Game of Thrones with its epic, painful battle scenes with the dead. Back to the neighbors. Why are they hanging out in the kitchen until 2 a.m.? cleaning, cooking, making so much rattling noise. My wife is finally asleep. I'm wide awake listening to them argue about God knows what while cooking the next day's dinner. Well, it does smell like onions. I do not know when they stopped, when they may ended their cruel oral torture, but at some point I started to fade into a kind of fitful slumber. Now I am trying to shake me right and avoid the stinging sunshine. Conflicting sirens. Sometimes I wish I could hide in a new empty seltzer box like my guinea pigs who munch on hay, carrots, and other crunchy snacks and forget the moments where the falcons are coming for me. The end is always near and forever. No matter where we run or hide or how clever. I'm not there on the front lines, but every day my vision becomes fuzzier reading story after horrific story, and its avalanche is like heavy metal descending over my head in 50 a mile an hour winds. I'd like to say my wife and I are well, and we are, and not, relative to the circumstances and the day. What we ate, who we heard wrong whom outside our winds. If we remember our dreams, nightmares, a future that looms instead of rises in exasperation, at finally returning to abnormal and observing the same blazing sun, the same downpours, the same hungry mouths. Sometimes I wish I could hide 
and realize I have always been hiding from myself, everyone, and their conflicting silence. Thank you, and we're going to introduce our first open micer of the night, John Breitbart. Give a round of applause for John, everyone. There's a word for our home I'd like you to know. It's named for our tongue, and here's how it goes. It begins with anthro, two syllables that pack a punch, and ends with pocene, it'll make you give up your mind. Anthropocene is the name of this time when humans took control of the seer and the sky, of the seer and the sky. So why should we care that this word came to be the listen for the things we see? There are people who study our planet's deep past with space on the eons and volcanic blasts. The weather of this place shaped events far and wide, and the living things change, patterns of water and sky. Ages come and ages go, billions of years through suns, you know. As mountains rise, the years run down and new ones appear as ancient cycles abound. Billions of years, now what does this mean? Really long periods of time are hard to be seen. A millennium is made from a thousand long years, many times the life of a person who for a moment appears. Then try to imagine a thousand of these, a thousand millennia makes one million years. One million years? Now that's a long time. In 65 million years ago, dinosaurs bone coupled and done. But Earth's History needs a longer time yet, the life that grew simpler when it began to be death. Yes, take a thousand million years and you have a building. Is your brain ready to explode trying to imagine a building? Yes, when life started as one single cell, it was billions of years ago. Three and a half billions, as what the scientists can say now. That's such a long time for life to exist, and we humans have lived such a tiny fraction of this. When first life came to Earth, Earth was already not known, already a billion years old, and so hot it was not done. Yes, Earth's four and a half billion years were about many newsworthy things, from trilobites to ferns to humans with shining wings. It's the humans that came from monkeys, they say, who discovered the science of charcoal and flame, who mastered the world of material science and set out, set out to unite the world. These anthros were fierce and smart to boot. They created a system whose secret was loot. Loot from the mines, and loot from the trees, and loot from the burning of fossil fuels that travel our seas. The soot from this burning gave Earth a new coat, and the gas from the burning turned our sky into a coat. As the coat thickened, the heat from sun's light turned up the tent and began to exterminate life. Places the bugs, plants, and animals live began to create out of bounds. Some bugs multiplied while others wasted away. The sixth great extinction appeared here to stay. Humans, how humans were we done? The Anthropocene has come to seal the fate of everything. The fate of the whales, the bears, the frogs, birds, and trees, and perhaps the fate of most humans. That's me and that's me. What began in earnest with the Gilded Age of machines rolled up pastures of plenty and turned them into urban scenes where the suffering of babies is no longer heard and the visual soundtrack of the industrial world. Industrial dreams and money-making schemes became the beginning of the end of the scene. You see, the geologists give names to time, names to the lines of Earth travels its path, a voyage through time, its greatest time ever last. Humans are humans for the time. The Anthropocene has come to seal the fate of everyone. The fate of the whales, the bears, the frogs, birds, and trees. And perhaps the fate of most humans. That's me and that's me. Another round of applause for John, everyone. I'm Greg Park. 
welcome our next open mic, mic open micer to the stage, Dee Dee Champagne. Give an applause for Dee Dee, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and greet these wonderful readers. Hello, everyone, and once again, I feel so honored to be here with this beautiful reader. Uh, this first poem I'm going to read is I am to love reading this poem. It just gives me a uh, Several magical feelings. Uh, this one is entitled Deep Thoughts. Reading beyond the first sentence is crucial. She's a fortune teller and is kind. On the moon. Her existence takes us to another place. We don't really have to bear on a stone. Just to cast a shadow on a page, like a hole in a cloud, or like written a leftover night. Her hair is a jungle red, is white as murder. Days and nights crisscross her footsteps, X. Y and Z. The sidewalk, like a piece of chalk, tapping the sidewalk. The jukebox plays a rough beat, placing the camera inside the hustle that aligns your swing. A wired brain into another day, and it begins all over again, tapping the sidewalk like a piece of chalk. Thank you. And this last piece. I put my ear against the wall, listening in as the darkness hour reaches just before dawn. I can almost feel the hospitality of my muscles, a morphine hind, working together, causing movement. I've learned to feel nothing from what you feel nothing. I pulled waves and winds out of my mouth and slipped them into the glamorous life. My rib cage filled up with sexy oxygen while the galloping stallions began clicking sparks with the carpenter in the stump. I walked like a ghost that ghost is me. Experimental meditation. I'm looking forward to that next diving bell as I turn the lights out and between you and I, my phone number remains the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another round of applause for Dee Dee Champagne, everyone. Please welcome our next reader to the stage, Linda Black. Big round of applause for Linda. Hello, everyone. We all know that Colin Powell passed away from complications due to COVID 19. And he was a father, and I pulled out a couple of pandemic poems. Um, the first one was written early on in spring 2020. It's called Still Carrying Lipstick. I'm still carrying lipstick. Not sure why. These days, one familiarity remains doable. 
and invokes a feeling of normalcy, hearing. My hair is swept up in a ponytail beneath a baseball cap to avoid contact with this potentially lethal, novel enemy. But I purposefully sport shiny, dangling earrings each and every day. After all, the body is far more than a vulnerable organ. It's strength, it's beauty, it's a building must intentionally be kept alive. I wear earrings as if nothing has happened. Spray flowers are blooming as if nothing has happened. Songbirds are happy and singing, yet our numbness unmasked. We cannot speak of the unspeakable. We know not of death, frozen by conflicting information, with fear, shame, and pain, awaiting knowledge that will ignite our internal flame to melt the suspended state. Until then, I'm still carrying whisper. Hope always at least. I suffer quiet respect and quiet sympathy for all who have succumbed, my beloved father and mother. Silent mouths without whisper, accentuating the raw horror as we navigate this oddly morphed life. I, uh, I live right next door to a hospital. And it's uh, about a mile from uh, Elmhurst, which was at one point the epicenter of the epicenter. This is called the epicenter. I hear sirens when there are none, drifting on the vapid din, straining to verify their approach becomes reality time after time. It's a true war zone. Ambulance backup sounds signaling the delivery of victims to their destiny. On my own each night, over and over and over again. Angels quickly appear, clad in tattered blue gowns. What kind of bizarre heaven is this? Hundreds of souls on stretchers, extracted, extracted from the gaping mouths of rescue vehicles. Two external wolves waiting at bay. Standing by the window, I point and press my remote to change the telling scene on the side. But to no avail. And the round of applause for Linda, everyone. Please welcome our next reader to the stage, Elena Jenning. Your applause for Elena. I'm just going to read one poem called Faces. He stopped writing, and then he could only write in the abstract, like the light of the trumpet in the underpass, prisms of color. We stopped looking in the mirror instead finding our reflections in puddles of water or forgetting ourselves finding ourselves only in groups she carried her baby on her back during our revolution because she trusted and wasn't aware of any danger focused on togetherness we stopped in our tracks during our revolution and someone would continue our footprints like we once asked for someone to breathe for us. Thank you. A round of applause for Elena Jennings, everyone. The last reader of the open mic, Ron Cole. I did number two, the writer's turn line, five words to learn poem called Frank Appleseed. And this is probably really pathetic, but usually it's trying to write. <laughs> I've got a pocket full of tiny, shiny apple seeds. Unfortunately, I have a hole in the pocket of my worn out, dirty tent. I turn around very slowly and see the long line of freshly sprouted apple trees 
and smiling a true, happy smile at the Earth's wonderfulness. <laughs> Uh, I'll just read one song too. Um, I worked in bookstores many, many, many years. Um, and I've basically been writing poems about them. This is the one I'm working on now. It's, it's sort of pathetic and sad, sorry. Metamorphosis. I've been going through a terrible time, separating from my wife and everything I touched broke. I was working in a bookstore on 8th Street in New York City. The only person on a night shift, barely hanging on to the job, among the tasks I had to do every evening after closing was clean the back. Late one night, I accidentally knocked an empty vase off the back of the toilet, sending it crashing into the porcelain bowl, creating a constellation of tiny glass slivers. Fuck this shit, I'm out of here, I muttered to myself, knowing I'd probably be fired. But at that moment, I didn't care, because I was now broken too. The next day, I got to work, and the manager said to me, Ron, we have to talk. I froze. He was taller than me, and I'm pretty tall, but he was staring down at me, waiting for my response. Suddenly, my mind started racing like a cockroach when we turn on the lights to try to figure out how to save my life. He had a huge ego and felt superior to everyone, so it hit me I could try and use it against him. I know I did a bad thing last night, I said, looking up at him. And you can take the easy way out and fire me, or the much more difficult and rewarding path of bearing with me as I try to work my problems out. He stood there quietly for a moment, glaring down at me. Then relented. Sure, he replied, we can work things out. Best of luck. After saying that, he turned and walked away. I punched him and took my position behind the cash register. Thank you. Another round of applause for John Cole and all the open all the open makers. Okay, so we're I'm gonna introduce our our first featured reader. Joe Conquo is the author of Jazz Moon, winner of the Publishing Triangle's Edmund White Award. Joe served as prose editor for Newtown Literary and he helped investigate stories 2017. Joe's short story collection, Kiss the Stars on the Back of My Neck, is available from Amber Press. Take a risk of discovery round of applause for Joe Conco, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I'm going to read a piece from my recently published uh, short story collection, Kiss the Stars on the Back of My Neck. This story is uh, called, You Can't Do That to Gladys Bentley. Uh, Gladys Bentley was a real life uh, Harlem Renaissance icon. She was a blues singer, and piano player, a nightclub performer. Uh, she was also openly lesbian and she dressed as a man in both her private life and on stage. Uh, and the, and she was known for uh, changing the lyrics of contemporary songs and making them dirty. And the nightclub that she formed in often got closed down because she violated obscenity laws. So the police would come in and raise the point. Uh, so uh, this uh, this excerpt is is from uh, that story. Uh, you can't do that to Gladys Bentley. Gladys's fingers hopscotched across the piano keys, smashing out blues, dunk, smush, smashing out notes dunked in blues and dripping rhythm. It was her first song and her first set of the night. Her eyes hadn't yet adjusted to the dark club, the stage lights blinding glare. She couldn't see a thing outside the stage, but her explosive smile blazed as she winked and waved and nodded at folks in the crowd like she could see every face. They were too drunk to know any better. Eight years into this craze called prohibition and folks still acted like Saturday night was a bountiful Christmas with the overflowing, ever flowing gift of bootleg liquor. Especially at clubs like the Clam House where Gladys Bentley rang and groaned at the piano 
moaning raunchy, sophisticated, bluesy jazz and jazzy blues from 10 p.m. till dawn. Her clothes were as sophisticated as her music. No gowns or feathers or horsehair wigs for her. No, sir. Gladys manned it up, all 250 pounds of her, in sparkling white tucks and tails, white shoes, and white shirt and bow tie, all of it crowned with a tall, cock angled white top hat. Elegant white, dressing elegant brown. She was dapper, dashing. Debonair. At heart, Gladys Alberta Bentley was a gentleman. Her backup band pumped and bumped, ornamenting Gladys's piano, lifting it to the, to the melody soar. Gladys moaned out some lyrics. My brown bowl's full of berries. They're ripe and juicy sweet. My brown bowl's full of berries. They're ripe and juicy sweet. I stick my fingers in my berries. The juice knocks me off my feet. Someone licked my juicy berries. Lord, child, I had a fit. Someone licked my juicy berries. Lord, child, I had a fit. They said, when they said, I'll stop it, Gladys, I said, please, oh, please, don't quit. Her eyes had adjusted now. The clam house was packed, a cacophony of color. Whites up from downtown and Negroes down from Strivers Row and Sugar Hill. Men in suits and tuxes and chicks and flapper dresses with long strands of fringe drizzling off every inch. Negroes and whites mixed it up, drinking and breaking bread at the same tables. A Negro man fed broiled shrimp to a white woman, forking it into her buoyant mouth like feeding a child. A giddy group of Negroes and whites made toast upon toast with fruits of champagne like it was New Year's Eve. White jacketed black bow tied waiters cavorted through the narrow spaces between tables, noses high in the air, backsides swinging, one hand carrying a tray, the other perched on a haughty hip. A pair of white queer men on the east side of the room caressed each other's hands. On the west side, a colored pair locked lips. A mixed pair frolicked at the table in the middle. White guy on colored guy's lap, colored guy's fingers sunk in his boyfriend's mouth. Mannish women, bull daggers, white and colored, cut loose in suits and ties, their hair straightened, short cropped, slick back, arms tossed around the backs of their chairs, legs spread as wide open as an invitation. <laughs> Negro drag queens and white drag queens held court in royal breathtaking regalia made up like movie stars, styled wigs glistening, and those girls' gowns were more chic than anything on Fifth Avenue. The queen's curvaceous legs were crossed at the knee and swinging the pulse of Gladys's piano. The clam house, a rollicking black white island oasis set back from a brutal mainland. It was protected, oh so thinly, by the inhabitants' madness for sex, their craving to cross boundaries, and their determination to desecrate taboos and all of it galvanized by the inhibition-lowering magic of bootleg lick. <laughs> the place was packed, all right. Every eye was glued to Miss Gladys Bentley, of course. How could they not be glued to a 250-pound colored bull dagger smashing out blues? The spotlight made her smolder in her, like a beacon in her, her all-white getup as she dished out body blues. Got a deep hole in my floor. Come on, oh baby, don't you tease. Got a deep hole in my floor. Come on, baby, don't you tease. My hole is wet and muddy. Come on, baby, fill it, please. It was one of the naughtier songs, and that was saying something. <laughs> the kind of Gladys Bentley tune that had got the, the clam house raided in the past and would again. 
Gladys scanned the crowd. A couple of Negro stuffed shirts walked out, snooty faces painted with disgust. Good, Gladys thought, means I've done my job. And she'd done her job when the queers hurled back their heads so far with laughter, their chairs nearly tipped over. And when the drag queens nodded their royal heads, Gladys sat up a little straighter on that piano bench, proud to affirm their sage approval. Most of the white folks reacted like white folks usually did, squealing like brats electrified by a delightful terror at a Halloween haunted house. It's why they flocked to the clam house, why they braved their way to Harlem, to be scandalized by the antics of wild and exotic Negroes. It was Gladys's duty to give them what they came for. It was her pleasure to provoke, offend, shake shit up, antagonize the structures, challenge the highbrows who thought they'd seen and heard it all, disrespectfully let them know that there was no such thing. If you're good to me, baby, you can slide down my muddy hole. If you're good to me, baby, you can slide down my muddy hole. So stop clowning round, baby. Come send Gladys to her soul. She pummeled the piano in an extended interlude, a transformation from body blues to rip roaring swing, from tongue in cheek irreverence to jazz combustion. Gladys closed her eyes, whirled in the music, got fucking lost in it. Thank you. Round of applause for Joe Campo, everyone. Fantastic. Um, our next feature, Susan Wyman. Susan Wyman's new chapbook, Roommates, was recently published by Parkside Poets Press. Her chapbook in New York is was published in 2018. Her work has been published in the Patterson Literary Review, New York State Writers Institute, Trolley, Home Planet News Online, First Literary Review East, Post Blank, City Lower, Places That Matter, Silver Tongue Devil Anthology, From Somewhere to Nowhere, The End of the American Dream, and elsewhere. She's working on a memoir and pieces and a third chapter. She co-curated Third Friday. Queen's Writer Series in Long Island City, where she resides. She's also an artist and an iPhone photographer. Big risk of discovery round of applause for Susan Wyman, everyone. I saw an ad in the Village Voice for a two-bedroom in Astoria. 
The broker was in Elmhurst, Queens. I made an appointment and my friend Shelly agreed to accompany me. When we arrived, we met Benny, the real estate agent, who requested that I sign a contract for $5 to see the apartment. Afterwards, he drove us to a charming Tudor building with the garden courtyard. He couldn't show us the apartment that was rent stabilized until it could be renovated. Instead, he accompanied Shelly and me to the two bedroom directly above. The apartment had the same layout and was inhabited by a family of six. The rooms were large, with lots of closet space and an eating kitchen. After a quick look, we were ushered out. The layout was perfect. But renting an apartment sight unseen would be a leap of faith. Still, I wanted the apartment, but the landlord didn't want to commit until they were finished renovating. How can I find a roommate in town of these? I asked. I'm just going to skip to another excerpt from the beginning. Young women looking to save money who left set foot outside of Manhattan came to Astoria and drove. They arrived early when it was still light. It's cute, different, looks nothing like Manhattan. How safe is it? Where's the grocery store? One woman asked to see the laundry room, which was located in the basement. It was early evening and the gray cinder block room was empty. I could see that she was extremely uncomfortable when she broke out into a cold Manhattan sweat. Another came from Columbia University Housing and proceeded to interrogate me. Is it safe? She asked for the third time. As I walked her to the corner, the homeless man who sat in front of the laundromat approached her. Hey, sweetie, you want to get married? I got food stamps. Now we can move to the very ending of the, of the beginning and the beginning. Two weeks later, 12 interviews and over 100 telephone calls later, I chose my first roommate. Now I'm going to read some of the roommate's story. Roommate number three, Yuki. My roommate Yuki warned me she would not speak when she came home from work. She was a customer service rep and spoke all day. It was strange. I was afraid to speak with her. One night she spoke. She told me that she wanted my closet because it was next to her room. I told her no. After that, she never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> this one is Bess. So, do you want me to be your roommate or not? Bess asked. We went, we were. We were on the end train returning from Barnes and Noble where I had interviewed Bess for the second time. It was the end of the month and I was desperate. Yes, I said, I knew that was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. Bess was in, in journalism school and worked as a reporter for a local newspaper. Three months after moving in, she quit her job. She complained bitterly about being unemployed and be had become increasingly depressed. I'll never get a job. They only hire Columbia graduates. Best one. If you get out of your pajamas and leave the apartment, maybe you'd have a better chance of finding a job, I said. That was my second mistake. Mm -hmm. Then she met Mark. They spent most evenings across the street at Lula, drinking and making out at the park. Most of the bar flies ignored them, except for those looking to pick a fight. Halfway into the month, she informed me that she was moving out to live with Mark and asked for her security deposit. No way, I said. We had an agreement to give notice on the first of the month. You can't walk out now. Best retreated into her room. The following evening, I arrived home to find Mark photographing each room in the apartment. Hey, this is private property. Put down the phone. Mark yelled at me and told me that I was no longer allowed to speak to Bess. She's my roommate, and I want to speak with her to correct me, not to you. She's no longer speaking with you. You better return her security deposit. If not, 
I'll make your life miserable. I'll ruin your credit and ruin you financially. Get out. Get the fuck out of here, I shouted. Then I phoned my friend Jonathan to lived a block away. Be there in a minute. I'll beat the shit out of the guy. That's okay, Jonathan. I can handle him. If it gets worse, I'll call you. I stepped into the hallway of my apartment and in a calm, authoritative voice, I asked Mark to leave. Give her the money, he shouted. He hovered over me and pinned me against my bedroom door. Get the fuck out or I'll call the police. A few days later, I received a summons for housing court. A bloodhound reporter and her sidekick were after me. On top of the rent, I charged her an additional $40 a month for wear and tear. Apparently, this was illegal in the rent stabilized apartment. With no other recourse, I made an appointment to see a housing lawyer who advised me to return the additional $40 per month. Best departed in the middle of the month. I had to return the security deposit and a couple hundred dollars, not to mention find another unit. All right, and the next one is roommate number seven, Lily. The day after Lily moved in, she burst into the kitchen to show me the diamond ring, necklace, and earring that she had purchased for $12,000 with her school loan money. The woman in the store told her it was a good investment. <laughs> I hope she could pay the rent. <laughs> Roommate number 10, Betsy. The day before their arrival, my roommate Betsy informed me that she had invited two young men from Germany to stay in the apartment for a week. They'll sleep in my room and I'll go to jail. I don't want two strange men here without me. Tell them they can't come. They're good friends. I travel with Stefan and Eric in Europe. They'll have to stay in the living room. That night after they arrived, Betsy went to Jake's. The next day, Stefan and Eric presented me with flowers in the box of German chocolates. Like the chocolates, and unlike Betsy, they were sweet and easy to talk to. I thanked them and invited the handsome young men into the living room for a drink. So how did you meet Betsy, I asked. We met last year in the gardens outside the Louvre, said Eric. We chatted for 30 minutes and exchanged email addresses. It seems very nice. She invited us to stay, to visit New York numerous times and asked us to stay with her. Oh, Betsy told you you were close friends and that you, I'm sorry. Oh, Betsy told me that you were close friends and that you traveled together. I'm so sorry. We thought she had her own apartment. We really didn't know. Oh, don't worry. I'm happy to have you as Bess. It's Betsy I'm going to kill. By the way, where are you from? I'm from Frankfurt, and Eric is from Dresden. We're doctoral students at the University of Hamburg, said Stefan. We are roommates. Uh -huh. I'll just read one more because, and the last story is a surprise, and we'll have to. To find out what happened. Roommate number 12, Lizzie. Her name was Lizzie Renwick, a Long Island babe with a red horsey name. We met at a Starbucks on Manhattan's west side. One of us had come from therapy. She lived in Williamsburg, one, or one of those trendy Brooklyn neighborhoods. My roommate, she said, he was a kid. I had to clean up after him. Sometimes I get in the mood and I go on a cleaning binge. The first boyfriend she brought to the apartment was about my age, but say twice her age. He was kind of creepy. After a few months, they went to couples therapy and broke up. She lived with me for over three years and cleaned the apartment twice. Like other roommates, she never went into the living room and mostly ate in restaurants. Her half of the refrigerator was filled with wine, 
leftover dinners from the Bel Air Diner, expensive and cheap chocolates, and wanting organic vegetables that she left behind when she moved. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for Susan Wyman, everyone. Our next, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Sokin Zari Zvey is a mayor writer from New York City, a founding member of the Cambodian American Literary Arts Association. She has received fellowships from the American Apple Project, Owens House, Willow Books, as well as commissions from Washington National Opera, the Asian American Writers Workshop, an issue project room. In addition to publishing poetry collection, Aspara in New York, Willow Books, 2017. Sve has had her writing anthologized and performed by actors and singers. Sve's first opera, Woman of Letters, set by composer uh, Lilia Bugai, received its world premiere at the Kennedy Center in January 2020 as part of the American Opera Initiative. The recent recipient of the Opera America Idea Grant, her new opera called Strong Pony, will receive its premiere in December 2021. She teaches English at Queens College. The risk of discovery round of applause and so can Dari stay, everyone. Sarai New York is my book. It is published in 2017. I've been in the publishing, in the publishing world and in publishing years. This is like classic now. And I really should be writing a book, but stop publishing. <laughs> so I decided to look at some of my poems and remix them. So apologies if you're used to a particular version. It's called Lonely. Idolized them in curls, you cry, girls. You who stone nipples were graced by communist bullets. Our worship, sculpted. It is two more, sorry, I can't get into real woman dancers in this temple city, sculpted into the king's concubine. Her Asana costume slips off the royal bed. Stories out of the hands and feet, ancestral mudras, reminiscent of lotus unfurling inside the Buddha. Foreigners cup your breasts, shining from years in exploration, hold them captive. In their blue binding to the tree for pleasure and insurance. I don't know, how do you want to this? So I've been spending the past two years writing a couple of operas and also giving permission to a few different pieces. And so what I'm reading today is like brand spanking new um, and it's being set to, to music right now. So I've been um, collaborating with the composer with Rob Capital, who's like often interview on NPR to talk about classical music. And so we were doing, so there's a piece called This is America. Um, sorry, sorry, we came to America. And it's actually based on a children's book. So it was a, so I wrote two of the several movements. And so all the all the content is actually from um, lots of videos and interviews that I watched. And I wanted to use their words and create singable lyrics. So it's called Home Was on School of Working. That was a direct quote. I leave behind my motherland's cotton in my place of prayer, cups of samwards, and the slice of the cotton with rice cakes and noodles. These things are part of the 
I leave my ancestral names and languages down on the sala and rickshaws speaking meek off the phone. Wrinkled hands on go, meek, lushy winters. I have my passport. I'm ready to flee. I leave behind ghosts and regimes. They hung my mother with her sharp tongue. I stood the strain of hunger and thirst, not ready to meet God. My eyes opened to the sun. I am from all this and more. We are from all this and more. Home was until it wasn't. And uh, the final movement of this book into America. We were trying to have a few different American stories. So, um, but we can't really do that without acknowledging who's already here and those who came here involuntarily. Some of us were already here. Our tribe spread throughout this land. Teacher, what is that word again? I'm lost. The shirt is rough and makes me itch. I'm far from my parents, but still in my country. They said we need to learn the same things from the people who came from across the water. Do you hear the sound of the ocean from meadow and shores? The splash of someone who jumped ship. I'm so hungry. My legs are not stirred in weeks. There is a stench I will never forget. Even after cotton fields, I've made me forget my origins. I am in the land of masters where I am not born. One day our spirits will rise from the ocean depths, from the southern fields and its waves. I stepped off an airplane as so long and flip flops. It was November, and there was a parade. The people gave us five dollars and left. You cried because the bed was too soft. One day your cry was the first song. The song of all voices, American voices. Someday your child will walk home safely, singing with soaring melodies and all its delight. I am in love, and life is me. I found my way around the language of marriage of this country, settling to rhythms and sounds of life, like the songs we used to sing from the northern mountains of Italy. These songs would invite you to walk, meander, wander, until you found yourself home. I didn't want to start again. The fantasy of America was home of freedom and love for all people. 17 days after I got my diploma, I was on the plane. It was an adventure. I was 19. You can imagine a gray winter day out the window, gray stacks of fire, just gray and gray and gray color. Until I saw the Manhattan skyline glitter. My heart soared as we began our descent into the city of promises. I'll never forget the past. I'm fortunate to be here. Um, and it's okay. You don't have to, like, if you felt something, I love a good moan. I love a good snap. I don't really care about claps. Obviously, it was the end. Um, I love the sound of it. Of the coffee machine. It's so real. <laughs> Sorry, I really didn't think this out. I said, you get tired of reading the same poem. Why did I tell you? Yeah. So this is for this is for my mom. How fortunate the community. She worked at a hotel for 22 years. Each morning, she would sneak up in a dry clean baby blue uniform, her name stitched in baby blue. She clocks in at Times Square among the friends and the backs of the workers polishing faucets and her English. She wears permanent gloves and dry cracked arms. The housekeeping cart screeches. Is the train outside for housing development? A mere four or eleven, she's mistaken for Chinese, freckled. Beside Asian almond eyes, short fur, and dark eye, two composed like a magazine, smile belly, trembling from four children. I'm going to read you a poem that I have almost never read aloud. I don't know, some just don't seem to be conducive to that. It's called Seeing Red. From your bed, we cause the blackout. Our tongues play staccato breath. Hands look for places to land. These small fingers are hungry, hearts itching, wet from misty nights. We fell asleep to a glow from across the room. 
In the studio, I sing lyrics about who the red and white wants to record the best part of me. From late night jurors pizza to a standstill on a sofa sidewalk, sub subway mapping grades on the ground beneath us, I wonder about stops. Red signs signal for locking up. Ron Carter playing Autumn Leaves, those are studio. You joke about the benefits of taking a bass player. The songs were made. Less than five seconds into the ascending piano, I know where I've been in my memory. Every little thing she does is magic. Everything, everything she does just turns me on. You can't offer more than coffee, songs, and that red hair. Like Kimiko, sometimes I forget I'm ready to come. I want to cast you off as a convenient summer haircut, one moment you're embedded in my skin, the next and strands on the feminine floor. Now you're Chinatown, Alphabet City, the West Village, Carlsberg, Pizza Plus, Denmark, Scotland, Radiohead, Chris Cornell, the police. I was really everything to me in those CDs you customized for me, now covered in scratches, barely playable. Let's do one that's not so serious. It's called Will You for a Number Two. There is a bathroom window so large in this cabin, which means feel like a museum display. The sink is clogged from extra hair trimmed off a husband's beard. The toothpaste tube is crimped and squeezed for its last bits. The garbage can is a gate. The child enjoys a good sitting every night, sings while squatting, wants to write a poem called Good View for a number two. From the toilet seat, you can see a tree ready to fall. So when the time comes for a fire, where there's only the sound of you cutting off a log. Just two more. This one's called Jungle Crossing. 1980. The fields are ripe with nine months. Legs and arms rain down like Nixon's bombs in the Cambodia Vietnam border, bruising the ground with craters. This is how they wait for rain. Our ancient enemy, the Vietnamese, extend soldiers and appendages across our border once more. In their exodus, bronze Cambodians meet pirates who strip their dignity to gold as Thai refugee camps bed them beside dirty soldiers. And first world promises. I recall the plumping of our teens bursting with sucking juice from homilos ripped from their peels playing in the boardwalk. Remember the monsoons? The floods and the ponds, the children who did crops and family day year round, when life and living still matter. Music plays from an unknown distance. Survivors gather to resume dance, unfinished, unfurling their fingers and gestures. Once described as Lotus Crossing. Uh, so, one thing I do have to promote is I have an opera premiering in uh, December um, at Yale University, and it's called Chuang Bun Lei, which is a Cambodian phrase uh, literally meaning to cross the river, but it's also an idiomatic phrase for giving birth for the first time. The idea is that Cambodian women, when they give birth, it's, they're crossing the river. Um, so it's a three-part opera, and it's about the stories of three different women and sort of universal struggles um, as women. And the second one is actually about a woman whose husband um, is a, a famous pianist and is performing, but she has children left alone and develops postpartum depression. And her name is Anya. And this is kind of the final aria. The Anya is holding a baby, and the music is taking a dark and different turn. She seems distant from the piano. So in the in the opera, it's a one-time opera, but the pianist, the person playing the music, is also sort of an actor. So the piano is kind of an actor, a uh, stand-in for the husband. She shouts at the piano to stop. Quiet. Just one more moment of quiet is all we can need. One more without the endless cry in this day that never ends in the night that differs only in light and what ornament hangs in the sky. There's a brown paper bag in the closet. 
of old clothing I can't fit anymore. The baby will fit perfectly. Just one more moment, she sobbed. Give me that, and then maybe I can go on. She sobbed. I am almost gone. No one knows this, but soon I will be gone where there is only quiet, and I won't have to count just as hours and minutes, time signatures and papers. There's no smoke and noise of a singular cry. The only cry, and it's not mine. Help me. Someone. Just one more moment is all I need. I'll end that time. And this is where she um, kills the child. What is that strange music I can go on? Thank you. Another round of applause for some guitarists today, everyone. Our final feature of the night. Again, once again, thank you to Fabulous Cafe on all the employees. Ashley um, Chedabao is a Cambodian American writer and poet. She is an infant survivor of the Khmer Rouge and daughter of refugees, as well as a feminist stay at home mother in New York City. Her work has been published by Great Weather for Media, New Ohio Review, the Adirondack Review. Raising Mothers, Poets of Queens, Newtown Literary, and Elsewhere. She was a 2019 Emerging Fellow at Aspen Summer Word, the 2020 New Work Grant recipient from the Queens Council of the Arts, a 2021 Bethany Arts Poetry Resident, and will be an incoming Poetry Fellow at Kundaman Writers Retreat. A big risk of summary, round of applause for Chenda Bao, everyone.
Cambodia and all we lost there from an unhealed wound. I don't remember Cambodia. I was born under the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge. I was a few months old when my mother carried me out of the country. She didn't have to abandon me, she liked to tell people, because I never cried in the dream. We reunited with my father in the refugee camp completely by chance, and eventually arrived in the US with all our belongings stuffed inside a large plastic bag and blazoned with the logo of the Refugee Resettlement Agency. I don't remember any of it. To have survived all that, I must have been loved unconditionally, unfailingly, with other faith in my preciousness. But where does the unremembered reside? Our life in the US was about moving on, and my parents' unheeded trauma, partially the daily administrations of love. I don't have memories of posting that intended word. Instead, I remember the burning sting of a chopstick across my open palm for being too loud. Maybe this is why, when my parents let me loose in the public library, I escaped into, into the refuge of books. Reading was a kind of private freedom, a space of perfect possibility. I read anything and everything that caught my eye. I was smitten with the absurdities of Amelia Bedelia. I joined the investigations and deductions of Encyclopedia Brown. I questioned and plotted with Ramona Kennedy. I accompanied Lucy, Susan, Peter, Edmund, and later Prince Caspian and Lisa Chutkinas on their quest to Narnia. Every book gave me language for the impossible. I found bits of myself in talking animals, aliens, goddesses, ghosts, monsters, wizards, as well as ordinary fourth graders, younger siblings, kid detectives, historical figures, bullies, and babysitters. I already knew from my own family history that anything was possible. But there were lessons for each story. Every literal rupture and repair that were inaccessible in their real life. In my family, we didn't really repair, we mostly tried to ignore. Though it was transformative for me to understand the power of words to conjure both the realities of life on earth and the whole world beyond the confines of personal experience. Later, I would recognize that we are all invited to our own conjuring our own remaking. Now, for my young children, I read Goodnight Moon like I'm enchanting a spell. We enchant ourselves with the long bounce sounds, the rhymes, and the repetitions. As I read it, I realize I have always been a poet. The wave-like pace of the words beckons to me. The poem gathers me in as the sleepy bunny Gains all of those disparate associative objects in the bedroom. The kitten, the mitten, the fox, the sock. I sense a kinship and an invitation to simple, deep attention, to the immediacy of wonder, and to the elusiveness of language. Good night, nobody. Good night, mush. Help me to pause here. In this suspending moment, savoring its strangeness, then comes the old lady whispering, hush. Poetry is made in the engagement between the unexpected and the familiar, between the sound of words and their rhythms, between the, the reader's emotional reservoir and the poem's own logic and imagination and between the poets and the readers mutual need for such magical encounter. Poems can be a way out of our ordinary understandings of time, history, memory, emotion, and sensory control. Once I started writing them, I knew I could ne never be quiet again. But I can't say what my children experience when we read books. 
They are so much closer to that free language, free memory, final land from which we all originate. And well, the distance between any two points remains infinite. They will inherit, like me, an inventory of unspeakable tragedy from Cambodia, as well as the unremarkableness of a somewhat privileged life in the US. Perhaps like me, their response to such juxtaposition will be to harness language, describe, interrogate, imagine, and ponder the capaciousness of human experience. Perhaps not. I will let them make their own way to the making of this world still in process and in progress. Parenting, much like art and poetry, is a continual practice in faith and surrender. And after all, no childhood is ever squandered if you can get through it. Thank you so much. Round of applause for Chenda Bao, everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, supporting Fabio Cafe, Ashley at Fabio Cafe. Big round of applause for Fabio Cafe, everyone. Delicious food. I, think I want to thank all of you for my readers and um, all my featured readers. Uh, uh, Chenda, Sokathari, uh, Susan Wyman, um, Joe Okonkwo. <laughs> I'm trying to use my memory, but I, I, I have to check myself. Um, so, um, I, you know, the next, uh, we'll, I hope to have another, we're going to have another one next month They're on the third Tuesday. And um, keep risking, keep discovering, keep imagining. Let's keep building this Queen's literary community and supporting each other by the books and all that. And um, I'll see you next time. Have a good night. <laughs>